Welcome to the Week in Sports Cars on the Marshall Pro Podcast, presented to you by Cooper Tires and the Justice Brothers and my brother of European sports car reporting. Who is that on the other line from England? C'est moi. Uh, C'est Graham Goodwin, as they don't say in France unless they're speaking very strangely. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome. Hi, Marshall. How's it all going? Well, a very busy weekend last weekend. I was in mid-Ohio for, I think, 42 hours or something like that. Had to head back on Saturday to tend to some family business at home. You were in the North Pole, I believe, yep. for the yep. uh, the Santa Claus six hours of Absolutely. snowy multi-class madness. We had Trans Am at WeatherTech Raceway Laguna Seca in Monterey. We had DTM doing all kinds of wonderful things with an Audi 1, 2, 3. I'm sure we had uh, Roger Penske blitzing the field along with uh, his partners at Dick Johnson Racing down under in the Australian V8 Championship. I just, I, Super I always, GT? I just Super wanna, GT? No, I just want to call it V8. I mean, I struggle. I just always <laughs> want to call it V8 Supercars. The Australian Supercars Championship doesn't really jump out to me the way that it should. Uh, uh, but regardless, yes, after a lot of acrimony there, the new Mustangs being too much of this and too much of that, and their center of gravity is too low, and we're going to tweak this and tweak that, Still pretty funny to see the captain succeed there. Then to have the captain also win, hop on a plane from down under, get to mid-Ohio shortly before the start on Sunday to watch the Acura Team Penske RX-05 DPI driven by Dane Cameron and Juan Montoya, our friend of the show, win there, their first win with that car since the program debuted, second overall for the team, both at mid-Ohio, coincidentally, and then we had all kinds of fun stuff that you were celebrating and covering between shoveling out corners and uh, higher cars to get home in Spa. So with all of our categories that get broken down by DailySportsCar.com's Ryan Kish across IMSA, WC, Asian Le Mans Series, ACO, SRO, Fun in general, as the official chooser of where we start each week, Graham, where shall we go first? Well, I'm British, uh, which means I'm polite. Not as polite as Canadian, but pretty darn polite anyway. So we're going to go with your bailiwick, which is IMSA. And I'm going to serve them up to you like Roger Federer on acid. Here we go. Will current LMP2 chassis be used as the base for DPI 2.0? Asks sport, Sports Car Dib, I think it is, from the USCR Reddit group. Assuming the DPI 2.0 continues on the current trajectory, will they be using the same chassis as the current generation? What's the likelihood we'll see IMSA allow someone develop a DPI around something other than the current four options? That is a wonderful question without an immediate answer. There's a lot of things taking place right now, Graham, and dear listeners, on the IMSA DPI 2.0 front put up a speculative story over the weekend that, let's just say from a stylistic standpoint, uh, you always love as a reporter to write things as facts. This is what it is, sometimes for a variety of reasons, sometimes because you're asked to do so. You're asked to maybe phrase things that are pretty darn solid as a rumor because sometimes folks don't want to go on the record and can confirm those things directly to your face. But uh, wrote about a couple of things in the works right now, and I know that we've got more questions on those, Graham, about DPI. Could it be a solution for the world here in a couple of years? And this question certainly fits into it. I think if this was strictly a American-based question of will IMSA with DPI 2.0, which will be here in 2022, if it was strictly a consideration for American border within North American borders, I would say there would probably be plenty of latitude on, well, hey, do we want to try and grandfather a, I don't know, a Janetta LMP1 chassis? Could that be converted uh, since dimensionally, if we're talking the just the core components of the tub and whatnot, that we have LMP2 cars that are built to LMP1 strength and regulations, but play in LMP2. Could that be done? Could we take a Janetta? Could we take pick one of the other uh, LMP1-based chassis? Could we draw from more than just the four 
that were approved for spec LMP2 slash DPI uh, starting in 2017? I'd say yes. The fact that we're hearing from very strong, strong circles that the ACO and IMSA directly minus the FIA are talking about resuming a direct relationship that existed for many decades, possibly rallying around future regulations, whether DPI 2.0 might become a global solution that could be used, uh, in particular at Le Mans. Uh, maybe that would shift this specific topic of chassis exploration more than just the lockdown four options that we've had. I think that might get kicked up a couple of notches and might involve input from the French compared to just here in the U.S. That sits neatly with another question a little further down the list from William Matson on Facebook, who says, Hi, Marshall. In reference to your, brackets, excellent, close brackets, DPI article on Saturday in Racer, uh, what possible outcomes are most likely? DPI at Le Mans with hypercar, DPI at Le Mans instead of hypercar, global adoption DPI. I think we're just in that kind of what's the opposite sour spot rather than a sweet spot aren't we mp where it's not really yet clear um i can come to what i know about where we are with hypercar perhaps in answer to a couple of questions later but what's your feeling at the moment the things i have heard the things i have been told again all this on background all this without someone going on the record saying aha fact 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 but enough for me to feel confident that we're talking about factual items and enough for me to feel comfortable to write about it, is this is indeed what is being floated right now. Hey, is Hypercar going to launch? Is this thing a failed... Is this Failed's maybe the wrong word, but is this something that might not materialize? Period. Uh, at minimum, is this something that might not be ready for prime time? Uh, what, Graham, uh, 17 months from now to go live in September of 2022? Is this initiative something that is just not gaining the traction or the solid buy-in to lock it down? Say, it is what it is, using Juan Montoya's favorite expression. This is what it is. Uh, like it or leave it, but we're doing it. These are the hard facts. We're moving forward. Since that has not been the case, and we talk about this every week, it's interesting to hear, Graham, uh, and dear listeners, that it appears, at least on the ACO side and the IMSA side, there's deep conversations about using DPI 2.0 as the new top class with the logical follow-up of in place of hypercar. So I've heard nothing to suggest what is being discussed is a hypercar plus DPI 2.0. There's a two-year discrepancy, obviously. Hypercar is meant to land in September of 2020. IMSA's second-generation DPIs, those containing some form of hybrid solution that they do not currently have, and we'll talk about that in a, momentarily, that is scheduled to debut in competition in January of 2022, everything that I've heard would be if all these things happen and there is actual buy-off, everyone's in agreement and they say we're doing it, we're talking about Le Mans in 2022 having DPI 2.0, this faster, higher power, more everything version of today's DPIs as the top class, period, end of statement. And so that, to me, is fascinating that at some point in time, I don't know when, but at some point in time, there's clearly thoughts and recognition on those, Graham, who are in charge and run the 24 Hours of Le Mans, the ACO, Automobile Club de l'Ouest, come, come to the determination that maybe this hypercar thing that keeps getting floated around, changed, manipulated on a weekly basis, things being added, things being subtracted, permanent confusion and anger and acrimony, maybe this thing is just a big wasted effort. And we better, since we hold the control over the single most important sports car race in the world, the thing that is the true backbone of the WEC, maybe as the controllers of this, 
we need to take our destiny in our own hands and point it in a direction that we think is going to be one that fits the times. Not saying that DPI 2.0 is the best idea ever. Not at all. I've seen, we've all seen LMP1 hybrids uh, just unbridled. Those things are amazing. Those things are the craziest prototypes I've just about ever witnessed. I was fortunate to grow up in IMSA's GTP era and, and have seen essentially every uh, one of every significant GTP car run. And, you know, we're talking that same kind of halo level of, oh, my God, type amazing. DPI 2.0 will not be either one of those. It might get somewhat close. But, you know, this is not crazy technology, uh, outer space type technology we're talking about here. What it is is a more cost-effective approach to prototype racing that fits the times. That's in clear reaction to the costs getting out of control and LMP1 hybrid collapsing. So, at least for what I'm looking at and thinking, trying to put myself in the mindset of those at the ACO Graham, it's those folks thinking of themselves as stewards curators and protectors of sports car racing on a global level and trying to see what makes the most sense both financially and conceptually to restore health and keep things ticking along until hopefully we have some sort of global recognition that hundreds of millions per year need to be funneled back into big sports car programs we're not there anymore and so the ACO talking with IMSA, seeing how they could align on something that fits today's financial place, that seems to me to be the underlying common sense taking place in these discussions. I, I'll add just this, MP. The, the timeline is going to be something along these lines. Uh, on May the 16th, there was a technical working group at which it is my understanding that there will be uh, an attempt to see whether or not there is um, real commitment to the announcement of programs and if possible timescales of programs from the manufacturers there present. It's a pretty wide group of manufacturers. Um, it is my guess that should that not, should that come, I think we'll hear something at Le Mans. In fact, I'm sure we will. Should that not come, then I think we're then into plan B territory. I would absolutely urge the, the GTE Pro Plus nonsense that's been peddled all over the place, um, that is something that has absolutely not been treated as a serious, even as a stopgap. That's not going to be the solution. DPI, well, let's talk about uh, talk a little bit about hypercar first. I, I will admit to have been, had a moment, had one of those kind of, whatever the, uh, the opposite of a eureka moment is, having seen what was actually proposed as being the final results post, I'll say what I see, dumbing down to accommodate the road car uh, versions of hypercar. And I will say that having uh, been in a position where I was fully supportive of the original proposals, seeing that spec sheet, 1,150 kilos, I, I was utterly underwhelmed. It just, you know, it, it struck me as being... Guys, if this is what we're going to get from that rule set, honestly, we need to be looking at a better way. Um, we're now in a situation where the only major manufacturer, major OEM, with a due respect to Jim Glickenhouse and for that matter to buy Collis, um, Toyota, are increasingly and very publicly irritated by the lack of commitment to this rob Lippen's comments to you oh, on sunday it, it, at spa were it, i mean boy you want to talk about he wasn't necessarily lighting the flamethrower but he was definitely fueling that sucker up well i think i think rob sees the prospect of them having a meaningful program going forward as disappearing fast and i am now openly wondering whether or not uh, toyota with their commitment to the fi uh, fi world endurance championship are going to be sacrificed at the altar of a plan B. Is that a part of what plan B, um, you know, is, is going to be. And ultimately I'll say this to anybody listening. I know they do uh, from our powers that be you're leaving it to speculate. If we're getting it wrong, don't come to me and tell me we've got it wrong. And that's outrageous because you fundamentally failed to communicate progress here 
through a meaningful challenge uh, uh, channel. Um, you know, if we're getting our speculation wrong, then I'm afraid you're going to have to look in the mirror for who's who's at fault there, because it's not us. Uh, it's not the people who care about this beyond the kind of the uh, oak lined offices of power. Um, it's you guys. You need to learn to communicate better about these things and to trust people with some of the thoughts and notions they're doing the rounds. Because at the moment, this does not look good. It does not reflect well on the process that's actually underway. That uh, miniature, us- well, that, but hold on. We, we got, can't miss a sponsor plug. That miniature <laughs> soapbox moment brought to you by Christoph Bouchou's Hammer Emporium. Have a problem, possibly one that's technical, solve it with a hammer. Christoph Bouchou's Hammer Emporium. Um, you know, one question that we got here that might help continue the conversation, I think that one is credit to uh, our man Ryan Terpstra for mentioning that. Um, one question here that might just continue this theme, there's a lot of inter- interconnected stuff that comes in from Nate Detweiler, who says, MP in your racer article about the future DPI, You wrote that nine manufacturers are said to have attended a DPI steering committee meeting. Any chance you could fill us in on who was at the table or maybe who wasn't? Uh, I'm going to hold off on doing that right here, Nate, because I still haven't written about it yet. And I need to do that because ultimately my clients, well, my clients always come first. Not that you all come second. But I try not to break things here. I don't even know if breaking is the word. Podium not, finishes. Not Roll quite, podium finishes. Yeah, not quite a hashtag breaking exclusive scoop. But if I haven't written about it first for my clients, I try not to uh, put things in here that would have them going, uh, hey, idiot, uh, uh, get your priorities straight. So, But I will mention that coming back to something that I uh, mentioned just a little while ago about DPI 2.0 and hybridization being the major step change from what we have with DPI uh, 1.0 is that electrification question. We know these cars will have a hybrid system. That I believe there's universal buy-in now, or uh, at least close to universal to say it's going to happen. One item that I heard about with pretty darn good authority uh, coming from this Thursday Mid-Ohio DPI Steering Committee was there was one manufacturer that threw an absolute wobbly for the low power? I don't want to say low ambition, uh, because installing, deciding to do a spec or spec-ish, something close where there's not much freedom, if any freedom at all, uh, hybrid system, that's not low ambition. That's a lot of work to do that IMSA would be agreeing to. But the low power that is being suggested i've heard it's i've heard don't hold me to this but at least for what i've heard we're talking 50 ish horsepower uh 40 kilowatts is the the number that i've heard uh thrown around a little bit so something in the slightly over 50 horsepower i mean that is if we think indycar i think they're pushed to pass uh giving the cars extra turbo boost for whichever amount of time is worth 40 to 50 horsepower so in theory, this hybrid system they're talking about, nothing's locked in, but talking about, would be a modest bump. I heard that one manufacturer threw a wobbly and basically said, hey, hybrid, it's really important to us. What you're proposing here doesn't sound important at all. This sounds small. This sounds really meager. So if you're just aiming to have, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm not claiming this to be, but just Something along the lines of, if you just want to have it as kind of a token to say you have it, that's what it sounds like to us. Uh, This, you know, 50 horsepower hybrid doesn't do anything for us. If you want us here, if you want us in for DPI 2.0, you better come back with something that's real. So I think that could be, Graham, uh, and this Nate could certainly be, again, a... (laughs) a transformational topic whether it's just regional the aco and imsa talks break down for example and it's just imsa planning their own future nothing outside of the north american borders then got it still up to them to decide what is best and what the various all the manufacturers would agree on in terms of hybrid system 100 percent spec or not how much power and so on 
if this does again get kind of kicked up to a global topic well all of a sudden we're taking the aco's needs Le Mans needs into account and could that number the the power number could that change uh, if the ACO were to say, yes, we're doing DPI 2.0, will that have manufacturers coming to the table at Le Mans to speak with the ACO, maybe independent of IMSA, although in theory the cars can compete globally wherever across both championships, but would that lead other menu- new manufacturers to come to France and say, ooh, we like that we can afford this, and we'd like the hybrid angle too, but who knows, maybe they'd be echoing the sentiments of the manufacturer I heard about in the steering committee saying 50 horsepower, that's nothing. That's not something we can promote. So again, there's a lot of stuff here that on April 7th, I'm sorry, on May 7th, 2019, knowing that in theory, January, 2022 is when all this would go live. I think it's a little bit too soon to say where this is going to end up. But I think it's somewhat clear, if we use this one manufacturer as a reference, Graham, that this is a there's a little bit of a flash fire that could break out on this specific topic of hybridization. How much? How much is too much? How much is too little? What are the costs? How do we keep those costs from running away, etc.? Uh, so that, again, I think that is going to be a big deal. Let me throw one more thing in here, and maybe this will bring a little bit of a wrap to this topic so I spent a good while speaking with <laughs> amazing, amazing Larry Holt, Multimatics Chief Technical Officer at Mid Ohio, and he raised a great point. Something I've been mentioning from time to time, but he put it in a very concise manner, and that is, if you look at the confusion going on with hypercar rules, what is it? What should it be? Production based full bespoke carbon fiber manufactured by specialist racing companies, hybrid, non-hybrid, DRS, non-DRS, who knows this, that, and the other. If you look at where IMSA's at right now with this relatively locked down homologated DPI thing, the reason, as Larry was mentioning, the reason that we're in an awkward time where we have a lot of manufacturers wanting to show up and talk, but there are so many different thoughts and ideas on what the next thing in terms of rules and regulations should be is because the automotive world is in that same place. You have big shifts going on at auto manufacturers. Who are we today? Are we primarily an internal combustion engine company? Are we late to the hybrid party? Are we advanced way ahead of the curve in the hybrid party? And we just want less and less internal combustion engine. You have a, uh, an industry that as a whole, I don't want to say nameless and faceless in terms of a direction, but there's so much change and there's so much non-conformity in terms of where the automotive world is headed because there's so many ideas on where it should go that you see this playing out in a lot of confusion on this very specific topic of Le Mans, its future prototypes slash and or hypercar or DPI 2.0. It's just really interesting to hear Larry, who's as deeply embedded in the automotive world as he is the racing world, to say, you know, until the automotive world really, there's a collective direction where you go, all right, seems like everybody's kind of saying this is what they're going to be for the next five, maybe 10 years. It's really hard to pick a formula and say, this is the thing coming next year, or two years from now, when the people that you need to sign up with those big multi-10, 20, 100 million dollar checks per year to do it, aren't exactly sure who they are and what they're going to be doing a year from now, or two years from now. So again, I think we're just seeing on the racing side, a very clear reflection, Graham, of an automotive industry that's in flux and is therefore hesitant to make any major commitments unless something seems like an absolute no-brainer. I think there's real fear in the automotive industry, real fear. And what do I mean by that? I, I, because there are already obvious potential avenues to follow, none of them even remotely cheap. And I think there's fear amongst the decision makers that should they make a determination of decision 
in one direction, and that proves to be the wrong direction, at the level at which you're now having to invest in those kinds of technologies, that could be a career or even company ending decision. And I get it. You know, I think it's very easy for us to point fingers and say it's your fault, it's your fault. I don't think it's that easy at all. I think things have moved in an extraordinary direction. Glad you had the chance to speak to the uh, astonishing Larry Holt about this one. And, you know, what Larry says about the industry should be listened to very carefully because, as you say, he's embedded at so many levels with it. Um, Let's move on. Yeah, and, talk about and I was going to say, but I, I see a number of here in IMSA that I think I could uh, wrap up pretty quickly here and get on okay. to Weck, Aslam, Echo, Elms, because there's so much great stuff you have to bring us here. So if you don't mind, I'll actually just field some of my own questions. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, there are a couple questions. Thoughts on McLaren's GTD debut. Our pal Jerry Suddeth says, I hate that I missed a live podcast. We did that on Friday. That was a blast. Thanks to Acura Team Penske and Meyer Shank Racing and Mid-Ohio and Acura for bringing 100 hot dogs uh, to a rainy ch- location-changing podcast, live podcast, meant to be in Victory Lane. That was so muddy and soggy that it got moved just across the track. Uh, I, we did have an accurate head count, though, which was great uh, for this kind of last minute change where I didn't think many people are going to show up, Graham, because it was cold and all that. Uh, but Acura brought 100 hot dogs for folks, one per person. And at the end of the show, uh, there were four, as we got to the very end of the show, there were only four left. And so we had uh, a couple of folks who offered to wolf uh, a second one down. So, yeah, we had almost 100 people turn up with this thing where I'm like, boy, I think it's just going to be me standing there picking on Montoya and him calling me a fat ass. But it was a it was a real blast. Anyways, uh, Jerry's asking uh, thoughts about the McLaren debut. Um, also, we have. Uh, someone else, uh, that would be Chris Ward, asking, does it feel like McLaren is dipping its proverbial toe in the water for a sprint cup campaign this year, then go full GTD next year uh, with their 720S GT3, then maybe a DPI 2.0 in 2022? Uh, I think it was a strong debut for the Compass Racing team, guys, uh, with any brand new car to a championship that uses BOP, of course, that first weekend, if not the first three or four rounds tend not to be super, super dominant as a most championships will say, we're not going to give you full reign here to show up and upset the established order. So I thought they did well. I thought they did very well. Paul Holton, I thought, put in some really good uh, work as well as his teammate. But I would say overall, coming back to Chris's question, yeah, McLaren doesn't do toe dipping. If they want to do something, they do it. This is a customer program. I won't vouch for how fully customer or how much manufacturer support there was behind it, but I would be very surprised if this is not a at least one car full-time GTD program next year. And I'm hoping more because more McLarens in any racing class uh, should certainly help to drive more fans to the track. Go to Nathan Bart, who asks a question that I was trying to get answered myself about the outcome of DPI and the overall finish. Nathan asking, uh, how did the number six Acura get such, such a jump? Six seconds on the formerly leading number 77 Mazda in the pits, uh, asking about regulated fuel times and uh, a few other items as well. So at least in what I was able to glean from uh, speaking with our pal, Dane Cameron, who is part of the race-winning duo there, and also speaking with IMSA on the race directing and rules monitoring side. Uh, A couple things that went on here. First of all, when we did have this, hey, the 77 leading Mazda has a pretty good gap on the number six Acura coming into the next round of pit stops, and that basically inverting, and the Acura coming out with a nice and healthy lead that turned out to be decisive in victory. One, I don't believe the Mazda pit stop was super fast. Second, Dane Cameron did say that they were saving fuel to try and shorten their pit stop, and that was something that appeared to help. That's an interesting point, and I did ask for further clarity from the series. They basically said, yes, we have minimum full-time refueling pit stop uh, standards that are set, but also knowing that we 
monitor in real time both fuel flow rate, fuel level in the refueling tank to know how much fuel went in and how long it took for it to go in. We can also tell if a car, I'll just make up a number, if a car has a 30 gallon fuel tank or 60 liter tank and it only needs 25 gallons, uh, 50 liters, whatever the number happens to be, less than maximum, and the rest of the car service is completed, quote, early, we don't expect it to just sit there and stare at the, the watch waiting for it to meet its minimum uh, pit stop time because clearly there's no need. A full refueling effort is not required because the tank was not completely empty. And so if you're looking at a team that's able to save a gallon or two uh, during a stint, I mean, that would be pretty amazing. But if you look at a team that's able to save a bit of fuel and in theory does not need to sit quite as long for refueling, for what I was told, uh, common sense will prevail in the race control uh, offices and there's not going to be a, a penalty for missing the, quote, missing the minimum refueling time. The other contributor to this as well, Nathan, is if you go and look at Juan Montoya's outlaps on cold tires, these are just things of pure beauty. So that's another area where I thought Tristan Nunez and the 77 Mazda might have lost uh, a bit of time there as well in getting up to speed on cold tires. So a couple of different things happening that definitely contributed to the number six Acura coming out in the lead and then winning the good old race. Uh, let's see. This one's an interesting one. Comes in from Brian McCoy. He says, after two, two pole position starts uh, for Chip Ganassi, ran Ford GT this past weekend, that being in both WEC and IMSA, all four cars seemed to lack pace during both IMSA and WEC races, and multiple penalties in the WEC race didn't help either. Is the attention already on next year and the possibility of what's to come for both Ford and Chip Ganassi Racing, uh, is that having an effect on the current teams, drivers, and cars? Definitely see, Brian, how from the outside it might appear as such. Just keep in mind that when we are talking about, you know, think of any other sport. Uh, it could be in f the NFL, a linebacker who's hearing trade rumors about himself. Uh, that might be weighing on his mind heavily, but when it comes time to play the game, there's no way he can allow himself to be distracted because either A, he's going to get hurt, or B, it is going to make his performance suffer because his concentration is elsewhere. In this instance, we're, we would have to have drivers, race engineers, pit crew members, a large group of people with very different jobs all having to be distracted by the future. I can't see that happening simply because this question has been ongoing for months and months, even through last year when we were asking what's coming next. Is it a DPI? Is it a continuation and extension? Uh, maybe a year or two extension to keep running the GTs? We have on the WEC side, Graham, as you know, and I think many folks know by now, the four GTs run by Multimatic in the FIA WEC. They are out of contract with yep. Ford at the conclusion of the 24 Hours of Le Mans. I did learn last weekend, which makes me very happy to hear, that with this weird shift to this super season thing that starts and ends at Le Mans, instead of a, a traditional January start or whatever it is, early year start and late year finish, we have a program concluding instead of in October, November in WEC, we have something ending in June. In theory, you might say, oh, well, so does that mean that everyone packs up the cars, gets back to the shop, unloads them, uh, rolls the cars into the shop, wipes them off, then they push their toolboxes out the door and they're fired and done? No. I was told that, and I don't know the mechanism behind it, but I'm told that the WEC team will be taken care of through at least the end of the year, but they are out of contract uh, after Le Mans. And so this is where something you've been writing about, Graham, I've been writing about, many have been writing about what happens next. Still no answer, but we know that uh, we do not have a WEC 
Ford GT Chip Ganassi team that is just genuinely on the streets two days after Le Mans looking for employment. So that I'm really happy to hear. But back to your primary question, Brian, I think on the IMSA side, at least, and Graham can maybe fill in on the WEC side, as was repeated 400 times during the broadcast, teams had so little running in the dry that come Sunday with very different ambient conditions and were experienced on Friday and Saturday, there's a lot to adapt to, which means that, and there were certain teams more than just Ford that seemed to go backwards once the green flag waved. So in many instances, we had teams that held station. Mazda and Acura, for example, were the fastest prototypes. They stayed the fastest prototypes. Cadillacs were okay, but not super sharp. They actually, especially with the number 31 Action Express car, found a lot of speed and were challenging for a podium there. Um, some other cars, again, in a variety of classes, either held station. Uh, there were some, though, that just went straight backwards because they got it wrong and had to take some pretty big swings and guesses on the right setup for race day. At least on the IMSA side, that's more of what I think happened. Really nothing to do with any distractions about the future. Everyone, at least on the IMSA side, Graham, we know is fully good all the way through Petit Le Mans in October. So the, the future and any changes... Uh, still quite a ways away. Absolutely. As far as the uh, the WC side of things is concerned with Ford, I'll, I'll draw your attention to a couple of things we've discussed on the show before. The first was this swing towards the belief that uh, the two teams would be back in IMSA and in WC um, under particular banners. That seems to have gone in a kind of pendulum way in the opposite direction very recently and whether or not contractually people are sorted out whether or not we'll see the cars racing i think is open to real doubt the the answer will be known internally with the wc after the 21st of may that is the closing dates for 2019 2020 so that would lead you to believe mp i guess that we're likely to see announcement of the 2019 2020 wc full season entry at the Le Mans 24 hours I, i guess that will be part of the announcements made there the other thing I'll remind you, you, you dear listeners, of is of what uh, Marshall and I discussed what feels like a year or so ago when we were talking about, you know, at that stage, other media outlets talking about, you know, Ford are definitely coming with a DPI in filling year 2019, 2020, you name it, um, all of which was nonsense, uh, that don't assume they're necessarily, necessarily going to come back and do anything. Bear in mind the model strategy that Ford motor company are adapting which is moving away from uh road cars aside from suvs and minivans uh i think we're talking potentially focus mustang uh that's it globally uh that one of the possible options for ford might just be to do nothing at all and don't underestimate the possibility of that and I believe I might have been one of those monkeys who wrote that I really expected a DPI in 2020, I don't know, however many months ago. That was not based on personal fancy, though. That was based on many, many points. Uh, you know, The same people that uh, are many of the same people that have confirmed everything you've just said just now that yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't don't count on anything. There's a hope in this pendulum like swing of what Ford may or may not do, that there will be a decision that is positive, whatever that decision is. Again, we've laid out the DPI now DPI 2.0 in a couple of years, extended contract to keep the factory GTs going or no, just support customer GTs or a hybrid of the two. We've laid out all those different options. We're still hearing there's no decision made as to what will or won't happen. But the, the one thing that has cropped up very recently was the one that I guess I would have put the lowest percentage chance on, which is the at the end of 2019, there might not be Blue Ovals returning in 2020, uh, period. Uh, now, granted, if, uh, if Ben Keating wants to run the car that he owns, that's his. He owns a Ford. There is a Blue Oval badge on it. But that's just strictly an independent guy doing independent things. There could, again, I would expect more sales of the factory Ford GTs to privateers. But in terms of there being any real Ford involvement in top tier sports car racing, you know, this possibility of them just saying, now we're good, we're done, 
there's no interim project that that is standing out as something that might be taking the current lead but that could all change tomorrow <laughs> friends who like us would just love to hear an answer positive answer of course i even heard after a really strong suggestion last weekend graham that hey there really might not be anything that follows i then heard i think what is today tuesday I heard yesterday from someone who would probably know or have a good feeling that yeah that sentiment might have changed by the end of last week so <laughs> i again we're not trying to confuse you here we're just trying to bring you up to date to the real-time things we're hearing and it's pretty much spin the wheel or or blindfold yourself and throw darts at a variety of options on the wall. Stay, go, this, that, little bit of here. I don't know. I, mean, I guess I look at this know. way. Look at this way. In this crazy world that we live in nowadays, right now, it is my guess that it's an easier process within a large automotive OEM to not spend the money than to, to justify spending the money. I think that's a, a, a process, that's a thought process that deserves considering when we put our fan hat on and we tell people what it is we'd love to see on the racetrack. Right now, for right today, it is easier to just not spend the money. Let me grab a couple more here in IMSA just to wrap this up, and then we're going to jump in. And pretty much the rest of the way is all yours, Mr. Graham. Uh, have Michael... Michael Metropolis, whose last name we just love. Michael, you're one of a few people who have asked, mentioned, or suggested this. It was great to be at Mid-Ohio on Sunday, but the weather and muddy spectator areas at the track this year were really a problem. Could IMSA possibly find a different time of year to host next year's race? It's rare to have nice Ohio weather in early May. Uh, Michael, you could have said the same thing last year on IMSA's return to Mid-Ohio because it was very much the same thing. I think it dried out kind of like it did for qualifying on Saturday, a little bit for the most part, and then was was truly dry on Sunday. Yeah, I think there's a really great point here to be made. Keep in mind that at the same time this week, this past weekend, the Trans Am series and, and some other series, uh, vintage races, we're going on in Monterey where, yeah, this really isn't a rainy period. It's actually where the, uh, the, the Monterey date was held two years ago or whatever it was exactly. Now it's September. I'm with you and I'm with all those who are asking this question. If I'm IMSA, knowing that this point in time in the year in, Meadow, in central Ohio is often a rainy, rainy muddy thing, you know, you, you just need to be wise about where you're placing these things on the calendar. It's not like there's any bad intent here, Graham. But, yeah, there's a trend here that says if you want good weather and you want better crowds, and last weekend's crowd wasn't great. It wasn't horrible, but it was definitely down. You might think about holding it at a time where it is friendlier and folks would want to go out and see it instead of go out, cover up uh, umbrellas and rain gear and, and, and shoes that are get through mud. And, you know, you, you have to just think about the environment you're asking folks to be entertained in. And at least for the last two years, mid-Ohio has not been the, uh, the right spot on the calendar, I would say, in early May. Uh, let's see. Adam Farrell asks... Uh, is about IMSA and whether they might follow routes taken by the WEC, ELMS, Blancpain, etc., of taking long endurance races and cutting them down to some sort of sub one hour highlight package on YouTube or otherwise. He's asking if I know why they don't. I don't, but I will certainly forward this and mention, hey, you know, this would be a great idea. And if they're doing it and I've missed it, then that's my fault entirely. Uh, Travis Bender says, can we just talk about those closing laps in GTD? How about my man Jock, Jack Hawksworth with ice in his veins, all cap, all caps. Yeah, uh, we spoke with Jack. He was in our Inside the Sports Car Paddock show that went up on Monday. So hopefully you've had a chance to listen to that, Travis. Yeah, I love Jack. He is someone who absolutely deserves to be in a top line prototype program so uh great seeing him in gtd but yeah that kid's talent is certainly uh, whatever the top class is that's where he belongs uh lance snyder says is the mazda finishing of two and three on the podium going to be good enough to save the program or will it have to be a win and soon in order to keep things going 
Haven't heard anything about a, a win or bust type thing, Lance. I know that the team was, uh, and I'm air, air quotes, happy to finish second and third, but we're also massively disappointed to not be able to convert their poll into a first win. Uh, again, I don't know if winning has been outlined as the, if you don't meet this in 2019, it goes away. I've never heard that stated, but I do think the team is operating and thinking like if we don't, that could be the outcome. So call it a little bit of um, manufactured pressure on top of the pressure they already feel. But yeah, I think they're just behaving like we have to get a win. We have to justify this just being podium people. That's not going to be enough. Uh, let's see. Go two more. Two more to go, and then it's all yours. Chris Alfby says, with Bentley... Bentley's particularly being fast in the SRO Blanc Pan GT America World Challenge thingy. Besides the $1 million, why wouldn't somebody in IMSA try the Bentley? I would think it would be a good car on those tracks. I agree, Chris. We just can't <laughs> bypass the besides the $1 million part. And I'm not laughing at you. I just, it's just it's awesome. <laughs> um, so IMSA is well known that in order for manufacturers to have their vehicles compete in the series in the WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, whether it is as a full-fledged manufacturer entry, like in GTLM or DPI, uh, or even as a seller of vehicles, uh, a customer-based uh, manufacturer program like you would have in GTD, there is a required annual commitment that we hear is in the roughly $1, $1 million range. Uh, it's more of a commitment of up to that amount from what we're told, a lot of it uh, dedicated towards marketing. The the besides the one million dollars part is kind of the hard thing to get past. So I am positive there are folks that would love to try uh, and run the Bentleys in GTD. The KPAX team that runs them, uh, the the Flying Lizard Racing facilitated KPAX Bentleys in uh, what we I'm just always going to call World Challenge. Those things are amazing. I love them to death. I want them in GTD so badly, but. You can't really get past the besides the $1 million because without someone ponying that up and Bentley has said, yeah, we don't sell enough of these to make that expense justifiable. Uh, there's no way to get one in. And I can't think of a GTD team that would be willing to spend that much uh, just to play with a Continental GT3 car as a privateer. So, uh, yeah, yeah. If the argument weren't based around the $1 million thingy, then I think we would have a goer here, Chris. Last thing here, Tim Glass says, at some point, is the Ford GT program considered a failure? One Lamont 24-hour win and more chances. One Daytona win, zero at Sebring, with bad strategy and slow pit stops. As a Ford and Sebastian Bourdais fan, it's frustrating to watch races like Mid-Ohio and see another retreat to the back. Is it BOP or something else? I don't know if if I would ever look at it as a failure, Tim. I know that there's a feeling that they really do have something incomplete in terms of having not won a championship so far. And in theory, until we hear otherwise, we're just going to go as if 2019 is the final chance for that to happen. I would point to BOP, and I know that's a really easy excuse to give, but when you think about the Ford GT being a hypercar in a class that, in a car that was built for Le Mans, they said from the outset, we created this road vehicle to go and win at Le Mans. When you have that and it being recognized as that by both sanctioning bodies that uh, look after the car in terms of BOP, I mean, that's just a hard thing to look past, Tim. So not making making excuses here. Definitely believe that there should be more success than they've had so far. But yeah, this is a vehicle that just has got very heavy and had so many things taken away from it. To try and play with something like a BMW M8 GTE, which looks like it conforms to a completely different class. You put the 4GT and that BMW M8 next to one another, and it would take a lot of convincing, maybe a little bit of alcohol, to get someone to believe that these cars actually competed heads up 
in the same class. And so as a result, the BOP in freeing up the BMW and tying down the Ford, that has been a definite reality. So with all that, now it's time to go to, we almost need a jingle. We almost need something that we can sing when it's time for you, Graham Goodwin, to bring us the insights <laughs> on Weck, Aslam, Elms, and Aco. What, like the Jacksons, WC? As easy as, yeah, then I'd make See, it yes, uh, I think that's exactly what we need. Unfortunately, all the Jacksons are no longer with us to be able to do that. So kind of a sick comment there, you twisted person, you. Um, all right. Let's go to Big Racer Boy from the USCR Reddit group. He says, in the case of DPI confusion, hashtag me personally, why not do the same for LMP1 like they do for LMP2? Choose an LMP1-N, with N standing for normal chassis, put manufacturer bodywork and a hybrid system in it and call it a day. It would be more expensive, but it would make more sense with the differential to LMP2. I don't know. As I read this, it almost sounds a little DPI-ish. Uh, it sounds like DPI too. <laughs> I think the, the, the answer here is um, talking to a couple of chassis manufacturers. Uh, we're not yet sure, are we, what the strategy is going to be for DPI too in terms of how many chassis will be eligible, whether or not that will remain the uh, organisations with a licence for the next round of uh, LMP2 whether or not you might actually include uh, other chassis as long as they are, well, uh, given some kind of ceiling, both financially in terms of technology involved in it. Um, so the answer is, I really don't care what comes as long as you make a decision really very quickly and we get enough interest that we're not scrabbling around for, uh, for entrance. I'll address the other part of Marshall's story, by the way, with, uh, you know, the potential for, DPI2 become a global formula. That depends on something we haven't yet discussed. That depends on there being enough manufacturers interested in that to support both uh, the IMSA with Tech Sports Car Championship or whatever it evolves to by the time we get to 2022 and whatever by then is the global uh, product. Because sure as eggs is eggs, it is not going to be just IMSA plus Le Mans, it will be something. And whether or not that is the WEC as we now know it, whether or not it's some form of ILMC, which was the ACO product that predates the WEC, the reality there is, unless you've got quite a chunky number of manufacturers, and that means either a larger number than we currently have or a number that are prepared to do both, then you're going to find yourself in trouble. That absolutely needs to be the drive moving forward here, is you need to be finding those manufacturers that want to do both or are committed to one or the other, because if not, you are doomed in the period that actually follows that to the inevitability that one organization might try to poach customers from the other. Let's go to Cookie Monster FL. This is Graham. A few quick ones. Could you give us your thoughts of either misfortune or installation teething regarding the Baikalis team? How's their pace overall at Spa? And I'll also throw in another one here from Cookie Monster FL saying, I'm no betting man, but if I was to say at least two Janetta LMP1 show up on the WEC grid next season, you think I would stand to win anything? Okay, Baikalis. Um Credit where credit's due, the issues uh, for the car on track, they were hit twice, not their fault. This is very much an interim test bed with the Gibson engine. Uh, there will be a new chassis for the car at the Le Mans 24 hours, which is optimized for the Gibson installation. That said, their pace was really not very good at all. They were a classified finisher. Astoundingly, that means that for only the third time in WEC history, and one of those was the infamous Fuji race that never was in 2013, every classified starter finished the race. And in the conditions that were doled out, I'm sure we'll come to that a little later, uh, that is nothing short of incredible. Absolutely fantastic discipline by the vast majority of drivers on track. Stellar work, stellar work by the corner workers, marshals, and race control under Eduardo Freitas. But no, I'm afraid, not terrifically impressive pace from the from the Bicolis. On the Ginettas, well, if you've got somebody that will give you an each-way bet on that, I would go for it. Um, I know, because I've spoke to him, 
um, that Lawrence Tomlinson and his team at Garforth in Yorkshire are talking to multiple potential entrants for this. But you know what? That's not that unusual. We've got a ticking clock now to the point where entries have to be in. Um, what do I think? I think there's a definite possibility that we will see at least a Janetta on track. Uh, do I think we might see two? We might. We might see three. We might see six. Um, th- there is that level of at least verbal interest. Whether or not there's that level of interest that prepared to put the money where their verbal is uh, remains to be seen. I hope we do see it. I've had a chance to see the car uh, up close and pretty personal and how quick it is. It's a worthy addition to that grid. All right. We're going to jump through some more here. First question, I think, and I apologize if I've missed any others you've sent in before, but from Berend Peter Van Alderen, love this question. Hello from the Netherlands. And as I was at Spa and saw all of the hype of Toyota and what they achieved with winning the Manufacturer's Championship, what are those titles worth for Toyota at the moment? They are fighting nobody but themselves. So the Manufacturer's title, at least to Beren Peter, seems a little bit strange to me right now. Uh, first thing says it's not a Manufacturer's title this year. It's a team's title this year. Uh, that seemed to be missed by a pretty large number of people, but it was changed to a team's title because, as you're quite right, uh, there's just the one manufacturer. I have to tell you, Toyota are pretty darn pleased about it. I think it's quite a relief for them. It's their second overall title, if you like, after 2014. And I'll say this just one more time. I'm not at home to people banging the drum to say Toyota's done anything wrong or in some way this devalues things. They can only stand up against what's brought against them and they will accept or otherwise the rule set they're dealt out with that. Do I think they've been dealt a pretty easy hand? Yes, I do. And actually, I think there's real regret there up and down uh, the grid, including some at Toyota, in that reality is, even if they hadn't, they'd still have actually probably managed this title by this, this stage. Because the reality is, they've got much the better car in racing conditions. We saw... Uh, one of the SMP cars in the hands of uh, uh, Egor Arujev within a second of the Toyotas and beating the time of, uh, of Kaz Nakajima in qualifying. But uh, I think, frankly, with or without the EOT as doled out, they'd still have dominated this championship by dint of the inherent advantage of the technology they've got. Their punch out the corners, their ability to get through traffic uh, with that punch, it's just something where the even the remarkably quick uh, privateer LMP1s have got no answer for that. So it's a shame that that takes the shine off this. I'm going to say this. Congratulations, Toyota Gazoo Racing. Race is all of them, all of them. Um, and they have allowed the cars to race for the vast majority of this season. I'm not at home to much of the cynicism. I regret the fact that the rule makers effectively um, gave them a bit of a soft landing when, frankly, I don't think they needed it. This next question from our friend Sean Caldwell. We've gotten a couple times, but I'll throw it in here again because I think you have the same answer as Sean. Uh, asking about with the announcement of Ford having four different Le Mans winning liveries, tribute liveries for this year's 24-hour race, which one are you most excited to see? He says, hashtag me personally. I can't wait to see the golf colors. I believe that's your answer as well, isn't it, Mr. Goodwin? I, I like the golf colors. I want to see the super van. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Ah, uh, you win with that answer there. Let's go to Ed Joris. He says, Graham, I want to hear about this. Which of the WEC races outside of Le Mans are commercially successful? It, hmm. it's, a great, it's, a, it's a great question. Depends what you mean by commercially successful. Most people, when they talk about a race being commercially successful, talk purely about the number of people who come through the gates. And that's not unreasonable. Um, you know, And for that, where, where do we get reasonable crowds? We always get a reasonable crowd and a better than reasonable crowd at Fuji. Obviously, uh, we had Sebring this year, uh, which takes um, credit for not just for the IMSA draw, but actually the fact that we did see uh, a spike in the gig numbers uh, with a remarkable number of people that I know were spoken to saying that it was the two championships together that um, that did it. uh, Silverstone and Spa always draw 
uh, pretty good crowds. But you can't ignore the reasons why we go to some of the other places. Shanghai gets a beating, I know, publicly. I can only tell you this, that aside from when we had pretty terrible conditions this year, so I think the previous two or three years, the main stand has been pretty full for at least the first couple of hours of that race. More to the point, and the reason we're there is the hospitality uh, areas are absolutely full because this is where the manufacturers do business. Now, the reality there is a perfectly sensible question for you, Ed, uh, but that's another way of measuring commercial success. What business can you do uh, using the uh, the FIWC race as a hub? And we do see uh, things like the Le Mans Spirit Club and uh, the other hospitality uh, areas that are kind of uh, brought in by the teams and their sponsors actually remarkably full at the vast majority of the WEC races. You know, even Cota, where the spectator banks and the grandstands were remarkably empty, the hospitality areas were usually pretty well, um, you know, pretty well full. Got a question here from our pal Nick Dovbiniak asking about with Aris and Alpine allowed to enter as, quote, constructors in LMP2. Uh, why aren't they or could they be allowed to adopt custom bodywork to reflect uh, the sponsoring brand? Obviously, at least currently, Nick, under the LMP2 regulations, although there's a little bit of leeway offered for Aris and Alpine to add their name and uh, effectively take over the branding of those vehicles by name, uh, there's still the LMP2 regulations that do not allow bodywork modification. Uh, let's see, we've got about a half hour to go, Graham, so I want to make sure we get all the really, and get to the, the rest, as many as we can for you. Uh, let's see, uh, well, we, we covered this off a little bit, and you mentioned something here, but maybe you can share any deeper insights from our man, Right Turn Lover, who says, I know there was an avalanche of other things to talk about from Spa, but any news on the hodgepodge and a dodge of the Prote Mick GT face regulations and cars? Just curious if you heard anything from anyone, any glimpses of anything new or different related to Hypercar 2020, or if that was all silent on the Eastern Front. Well, we brought the most profound statement to you, as you said, with Inside the Sports Car Paddock, that is Toyota making it publicly very clear they are not amused at the continued delay. Um, the powers that be were conspicuous by their absence anywhere close to the uh, media room, and one in particular, I won't name him because it's not really fair, every time I saw him walking by the press room on the walkway that uh, goes by, um, was conspicuously... Uh, averting his gaze from it to in the room because he knew darn well, I think, that people would try to engage him in eye contact leading to conversation. Christoph um, Bushu. No, definitely not him. Damn he wasn't it. there. If he was there, there certainly weren't the number of fights I'd expect. <laughs> um, the, um, I think this has got to the stage of being embarrassment slash uber shambles, to be honest with you. Um, I think where we are right now is if that May the 16th uh, meeting doesn't come up with something pretty darn concrete, I think we're very rapidly going to be into a plan B situation. And if you're looking for as comprehensive and concise an answer as to what that means, I absolutely urge you to have a look at Marshall's piece on racer.com from over the weekend. Um, neatly done sir uh it's absolutely my understanding of where things currently stand lots more detail to emerge but i think if hypercar is going to happen it's going to have, have to happen in days and weeks now uh in terms of commitments tota definitely there in terms of the other major oems uh there's certainly signs that some people are flattered to deceive you're listening to the week in sports cars brought to you by cooper tires Brought to you by the Justice Brothers and brought to you by a new sponsor, Uber Shambles. You call, you text, you use the app and ask for a ride. We never show up. All right, we've got one more question for you from Weck Aslam Aiko Elms. This is from our man Ryan Terpstra. Interesting to hear on this. He says, Can either of you recommend somewhere to purchase? Something from the four seasons of Spa that might be suitable for framing. I've seen some genuinely epic images. There has to be some worth putting on a wall. What are the the year-long regulations as you know them, Graham, for photographers, for media 
when it comes to selling photographs taken at a WEC round. I know that at least over here, if we're talking IMSA and IndyCar and whatnot, there's often a much higher level of, of media engagement that is required, meaning, like we're talking IMSA, uh, you have to pay a lot of money for the rights to sell your images, and most photographers do not opt for that very expensive solution. Curious what it's like in the WEC, and if someone like Ryan might have outlets to go and buy some of the pretty snowy photos from last weekend. I think the, the answer is... Uh, I don't know. It's a straight answer, but uh, I think the answer there is um, it's not my normal bent. But I think that's such a ridiculous rule, bearing in mind the commitment that most of these guys make to a global championship and the amount of money it spends in getting there and servicing those clients. Um, have a look on the web. Have a look what you fancy. Drop someone online. See what they say. Go go for that. Uh, but my God, that was. I, I'll say this. I said it on air with uh, with Martin Haven and Alan McNish at the weekend. I have seldom seen weather conditions like that full stop, let alone during a race. It was beyond insane. I mean, three full-blown, what I would call mini blizzards, hail and snow, bright sunshine, pretty stiff breeze at times as well, uh, fog in the morning as well on the way to the circuit, trees down with the weight of snow overnight, and it's May. Uh, it was quite the most extraordinary event. And like I say again, you know, every car home. One other quick thing, by the way, that's been missed in all of this. Congratulations to Michelin. Uh, the second ever uh, win in LMP2 in the WEC came in amongst that lot with Dragon Speed, Pastor Maldonado, Ant Davidson, and Roberto Gonzalez. Congratulations to them. Uh, that was an extraordinary day. Extraordinary day. Um, it wasn't a difficult one uh, to find points of interest in for the seven hours that we were on RMP. And also congratulations to Dragon Speed with their LMP2 win. I believe I saw a note from them saying they have won in IMSA LMP2, ELMS LMP2, and now WEC LMP2 all in the first five months of the Correct. year. That's pretty amazing as well. Why don't we jump in to general, my friend, general and fun to take ourselves home. And let's see, we get this every now and then, but uh, this comes in from Scott Steve 2708. I love questions or names on Reddit. In your opinions, would OEMs continue to run in a separate GT formula should GTE slash GTLM run its course? Or would they use GT3 with full factory teams? It's, uh, it's a great question, and it's one of those things, I don't know if you agree, Graham, but a lot of big, holy cow, explosions would have to happen in the current landscape of global GT endurance racing for us to get to that place. But yep. we're also semi-afraid uh, we might not be too far... The, the, the wick on that might not be too long. You know, we, we could possibly be headed towards some of this if Ford's out, BMW might be out, at least on one side of the Atlantic and so on. What do you think? Have you heard anything from OEMs that if GTLM slash GTE goes away, they might look at, I don't know, what other formula or maybe just get behind factory-based GT3 teams where, at least presently, there's not a lot of allowance for that to happen? Uh, I'll say this much. There's, there's certainly no push from any manufacturer that I'm aware of, uh, oddly enough, other than manufacturers that don't currently have a presence in GTE, uh, for that to come to pass. The people who are in GTE are perfectly happy, um, that are staying in GTE, are perfectly happy with their programs. Uh, there is a move, Ferrari in the Vanguard, and now Aston Martin as well, to have a platform where those cars can be both. And that has drawn with its interest from customers because of that. I'll give you an excellent example. Alexander West, uh, the new proprietor of Garage 59, uh, operating their newly acquired Aston Martins and the Blompan Endurance Series, um, has told me very, um, very openly, I've not gone with a brand which I've had a long association with, brackets McLaren, close brackets, because in the case of the Aston Martin, 
it gives me the opportunity, should I wish to do so during the life of this car, to step that car up to be a GTE car. Um, what do I think would happen if it happened? Of course, they'd, they'd still want to race. If they, they, they still want to race at the Le Mans 24 hours, for instance, um, and there's an opportunity to do so uh, in a GT car, of course, they're going to do that if they've got a product. But there is absolutely not at the moment any push for that to happen. There's one good reason for that. The profit margin for sales on those cars is pretty hefty, certainly heftier than it would be on a GT3 uh, car, not just for the purchase price, but of course, the continuing supports, engineering supports, uh, electronic supports, and part support for those GTE cars. It's a pretty good business model for those that have already got a customer base for it. Rock on. Let's see. Go back to Cookie Monster FL here. MP being a California kid, I'm sure you enjoyed this past weekend's weather, all kinds of fun. What was the worst condition you showed up for at a racetrack, test days, practice, etc.? And why was it at Road America? Um, the one that stands out to me, and yes, there are many that come to mind, uh, a seven or eight hour, I believe, fog break while uh, in the midst of, I think it was the 2008 or 2009 running my team at the 25 Hours of Thunder Hill, that was rather weird. But the one that really surprised me, and probably because I suffer from a lack of intelligence and imagination at times, Graham, was 1998. The Indy Racing League team that I co-managed and assistant engineered, we were one of Firestone's a limited number of uh, official test teams were hired to go to the then still kind of sort of brand new Texas Motor Speedway uh, in Dallas Fort Worth, and I I apologize I don't remember the exact time frame whether it was later in the year or earlier in the year but we dispatched truck trailer car everything from California to Texas and at least the way my mind works when I think of Texas I think of arid desert like environment, tumbleweeds, old Western movies, this kind of stuff, steer and cattle and you name it. For some reason, I just failed to imagine that it could snow there. And I can tell you that showing up to do a Firestone tire test and landing in my usual shorts and whatever else and landing and looking out the window in the plane and seeing that, boy, it sure is white outside, and then having it snow just massively. The I don't even say the whole time because it snowed so heavily. Pitches, pitches, pitches. Yeah, that Firestone said, "Yeah, uh, you guys may as well just go home because this is not supposed to clear for a long time." And they still actually, because Firestone, I just have loved them for decades. Uh, they still paid not only paid the bill, but knowing how much we needed the money because we were a, a good but small team uh, i still think they wrote a check for something close to fifty thousand dollars for us not only for travel and time but loss and all the things we had to invest in got a fresh motor for the test so they took care of us financially but that one just definitely twisted my head a little bit to show up to go test in dallas and what is all this weird white stuff falling from the sky i'll, I'll add in a couple uh we've had uh, fog delays at a number of races notably uh, the Nürburgring 24 hours a couple of times uh, we had the infamous hailstorm uh, in the early part of the race just a couple of years ago which was uh, astounding uh, for me probably the rain at Fuji that uh, that ruined uh, the race that never was in 2013 it just did not quit and it was no surprise at all that we got what's it 14 or 15 laps on the safety car and then time to go home all right, let's see here. We got one from Lynchpin on Reddit asking, is there any upcoming technology that has you excited about its introduction to racing, either on or off track? I How's this? Throw uh, this one back at me, at least, and maybe Graham has something. Throw this one back at me in, I think, two to three weeks. I cannot okay. talk about it right now, but if the thing I'm told that might be announced... And I'm not saying what form of racing would be announcing it. It could actually 
wow, really move the conversation in a Plot very worthy. facet. Well, uh, yes. Uh, Pull back and go. Well, it, it's miniature stripper poles, so Graham Goodwin always has a job <laughs> in motor racing, although they're attached to the cars, and you have to hold on for the entire length of the race. Um, if this comes to fruition, well, the announcement will be great. If what is being announced in the announcement then comes to fruition, I think think we are going to fundamentally change a lot of conversations about what technologies get used going into the future in motor racing so yeah it's pretty big but again there's a lot of caveats that if it gets gonna if it gets confirmed then it gets announced then they actually make the thing they say they think they can make that would be pretty darn cool so sorry for being a little bit uh Nuclear. fuzzy on this yes Yes, absolutely. Uh, fuel rod. Yeah. Well, <laughs> sorry, sir. I left the fuel rod in the seat. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's see. I'm uh, just going to, you know, I'm trying to pick a few more here. What can I throw Go at you? It. Here's an interesting one from Ed Joris again. Ed, you always have interesting questions. We appreciate that. When a factory contracted driver gets farmed out to a privateer team, who pays the factory driver? He says, for example, is Honda Performance Development paying Dane Cameron to drive for real-time racing, or is real-time paying him, Ed referencing the fact that the weekend prior to IMSA at Mid-Ohio, Dane won in a Acura NSX GT3 at the Blanc Pain Pain Face. Again, the thing I'm just going to continue calling World Bump Challenge. Something, so, yes. Bump something, something. For real time, being farmed out to that, at least as I understand it, Ed, well, every situation is going to be different, so there's no universal way that things are done. I don't know whether Team Penske holds Dane's contract or Acura slash Honda Performance Development, Acura Motorsports slash HPD holds it, but I'm fairly confident that the Japanese manufacturer, the American arm of that manufacturer, is the one paying for Dane Cameron to be their driver, despite who he drives for. So, although I don't know... Uh, actually, let me ring Dane right now. Hey, could you send me your contract? Um, I don't know what Dane's contract contains, but it would not surprise me to learn that his multi-year deal to drive for Acura Team Pen or in a in an Acura Team Penske RX05 DPI probably also includes some other call it personal services and uses options. Meaning, if they want him to go drive in World Challenge or wherever else, that there's an option to do that. Uh, I don't know whether that would be rolled into a lump sum that would be up for Dane and or his manager to negotiate, or if it was a, you know, an each additional thing outside of my IMSA DPI duties, uh, a weekend would cost X amount. Again, everybody does things differently, but one way or the other, I'm fairly confident, Ed, that the manufacturer is paying for the pleasure of having Dane drive for them and therefore in their contract negotiation there's some wiggle room allowed that hey if we want you to do other things is that possible and how they settle how they settle that up either paying up front or on a as needed or as use basis i think that would be more of an individual manufacturer choice uh, that's, ge that's generally the, the case there are have been cases that i've been aware of where a customer team can request a specific driver and there might be a top-up uh, fee for that particular driver so, um, but generally speaking, yes, uh, certainly the European model is more or less exactly as you suggest. So with about eight or nine minutes left to go, Graham, among our fun and general questions that remain, why don't you pick a couple for us to go home with? Let's have a look. Um, are factory teams overrated? Asked Sean Sable from Facebook. Looking around the sports car world, there's plenty of compelling classes from MC GTD, WC LMP2, and hell, LMP1 wouldn't be bad if, if Toto was subtracted. Don't get me wrong, I think they do bring a whole lot, but with the way the world is going, I'm, I'm not as convinced we should be clinging on to them as hard as we tend to do. Do you want me to have a first crack at that? Definitely uh, have a crack there. I, I, got, I have something to add to it at the end, though, because I see it on a daily basis being affiliated with two fairly significant media outlets in Racer and Road and Track. I think the answer is you need to take into account what else they bring to the party, how much of a contribution for the major race series that we talk about on the weekend sports cars that I write about in daily sports car that MP writes about for his clients, what else they bring to that to make this crazy world happen 
and happen at the level at which it does, which includes, by the way, paying for things like TV, paying for things like some of the amenities at racetracks. Don't discount the investment that they actually make in the wider thing. It's not just about their performance on track, MP. And you've touched on some of those. This is not meant to say negative things towards manufacturers or sanctioning bodies. I'll just share a very, a very real reality, says the man from the Department of Redundancy Department. Um, we have a very interesting scenario, John, where your question, I think, is very apt. Unfortunately, it's also something that, at least right now, I cannot see how sports car racing, IndyCar racing... NASCAR, probably a lot of other series, would survive if we untangled and stripped manufacturers from how those organizations fund themselves to not only compete, but to exist. So Graham mentioned TV. If we go back to what I mentioned about that million dollars from Chris Alfby's question on Bentley, IMSA's not just charging that because it's the going rate. There is no, quote, going rate. It's an entirely made-up number. And not just by IMSA. Again, just about every sanctioning body charges manufacturers to participate at the high-end pro level. But the reason these numbers are significant and continue to become bigger and bigger is TV contracts. Paying for TV is now a thing instead of either being paid or having it be free. Uh, Many sanctioning bodies are now required to put the money up in order to be televised. Uh, If you talk about the same thing with radio as well, uh, that's not always the case. But again, the paying to be acknowledged, to be presented, that's a thing. The paying to activate the getting ads in the local newspaper coming up for this race, the billboards, the so on and so forth. In some cases, sanctioning agreements for events have gone from the circuit paying money to a share, or sometimes the Sears itself has to pay to be there, takes on the financial responsibility, and then hopes to recoup that money. That's where we've seen, in a somewhat general sense, at a number of tracks, there are some newly astronomical ticket prices where you go, what? (laughs) $150 for a ticket for race day? Are you out of your mind? Well, again, if you're looking at some numbers to get in to see a motor racing event, and again, I'm not necessarily talking a giant one like Le Mans and such, but just your average event, and you see the ticket prices just seem to make no sense, be fairly secure in the fact that the sanctioning body is having to recoup a lot of money and or if the track itself paid uh, the sanctioning fee, it was stiff enough that the only way they see possible to try and get some money back is to pass those bigger sanction costs directly on to the buying fan. Uh, But what we have right now, John, and this is the part where you raise a great point. It's just so troublingly intertwined is that if you were to strip away the manufacturers from the WEC, it collapses tomorrow. There's not enough money coming in. And I know I'll get an angry text or email from Elton Julian, which he should saying, Hey, you know, my money's just as good as anyone else is paying for an entry fee or tires or fuel or you name it. But the reality is you strip away the, what is it? 17, 19, I forget how many, a comical number of manufacturers involved in IMSA across a WeatherTech Championship, the Michelin Pilot Challenge, and so on. All of those brands, that money is funneling directly upward to make the series uh, survive. And so that kind of hand-to-mouth thing, that's become the new norm, John. And it is troubling. Where this has had a significant knock-on effect that I can mention from the from this side of things, and Graham, I'm sure, uh, has seen things as well from Daily Sports Car, is so magazines are dependent upon advertising to exist. Uh, websites are 
dependent upon such things every year for the past, I don't know, three, four, five years, maybe longer, but I'm just, in particular, the last couple of years really feel like there's been an annual ratcheting up of this phenomenon. Fewer and fewer dollars are available to do anything that, you know, pick whatever it is, the, uh, the marketing campaign for the, um, for some brand doing something in some series three or four years ago where they spent $50,000 with this outlet, whether it was digital or, or print or a hundred thousand commissioned a special issue of something who knows. Yeah. Maybe the following year it would have been 25. The next, it would have been 10. Now in so many instances, I'm hearing it's zero and it's not because they don't want to do that thing and create something cool and amazing. It's man, all the racing, all the budget for racing is going into the racing. Plus, and here here's the un, another underlying part, is you keep, I keep hearing of the cuts coming to these manufacturers. Many who've been in the sport for years and decades, some where you go, gosh, they, they've just been around forever. They're absolute bedrock part of this sport. They are. But even they're being asked, being asked to whack 10% off of their annual budget. I know of one manufacturer that the last two years, it might even be three, I know the last two for sure, they've had 10% budget cuts across the board in their motorsports programs. And so sometimes when you go, hey, boy, that manufacturer is always doing really cool things and they're inviting people and doing that and they're big hospitality things and, man, why don't they do that anymore? Well, it's not because they don't love you. <laughs> it's not because they don't want to entertain the media or fans or otherwise. It's because given a choice of putting race cars on track, supporting their teams, helping to drive awareness towards the racing or some of the fun and amenities that go on you know, ha that have gone on, you know, the non-essential stuff is getting cut as well. So I don't know what the answer is to this, John. It's a, it's a brilliant question and it's one that's very aptly timed as well. We are in a phase, as Graham knows well, here's, this might end up being the final question for this week, and please send, resend in, resend in, good Lord, Pruitt, get your syntax in better word mouth place, send in the ones we didn't get to if you really want us to answer those, but uh, we're in a place where without manufacturers, there is not enough money coming into these series through privateers to continue to exist, not without reducing WEC to, I don't know, Le Mans and Spa, or pick some other, yeah, pick some, yeah, probably just those two, maybe Silverstone, very continental, close with one another, one or two rounds, maybe three, but no flights involved, uh, yep. just strictly minimal travel cost, minimal everything, uh, we're having to cut this championship in half, if not less, IMSA, yeah, you're going to have to pick between 24 hours of Daytona or Sebring, we can't afford both. We're certainly not doing this. Well, we might actually just do Sebring or Petite as the one long race of the year. Maybe six hours at Watkins Glen, but we're cutting at least a 24-hour race, maybe a 12 or a 10 out. Can't afford it. Uh, we're not going to Long Beach. It's just a, too long of a drive. We're cutting two or three others. The two GT-only races, sorry, we're cutting down to one. You start pulling the manufacturers out right now with the dire absence of money coming in from sponsors and or they're just being a flotilla of heavily heavily funded and happy spending gentlemen drivers gentlewoman drivers and owners yeah we don't have a whole lot of of top tier domestic or international endurance racing absolutely agree absolutely agree um it's very easy isn't it to knock the factory teams when we get tied into regulations etc and by the way one quick thing i'll say is what a bargain still today the le mans 24 hours it's general admission ticket in uk terms about 80 of your uk pounds that's something less than half the cost of a ticket to the british grand prix um and uh, by the way that gives you the full week and it gives you test day as well uh, in general admission. Yes, if you want on a grandstand, grandstand ticket to it, it goes up, but then so does all the other ticketing for the major events around the world. Still an absolute bargain for what you get. Um, factory teams, yeah, we need to unlock 
the Gordian knot at the moment that's around in terms of the OEMs and their backers uh, and their future uh, participation of this sport. But for right now, honestly, guys, um, if you're out there and you're on uh, social media, it wouldn't be the worst thing once in a while to drop their uh, official Twitter feed or Facebook page a note saying how much you appreciate their participation in the sport because without them Marshall is a hundred percent right it's very unlikely that you'd have the choice of either attending or viewing the racing that we currently do and with that said thanks for listening this has been the week in sports cars on the little podcast I named after myself because I'm a raging egotistical bastard it is presented by the fine folks at Cooper Tires at the Justice Brothers, and the even finer folks at DailySportsCar.com, led by the, all caps, Graham Goodwin. If we did not get to your great questions this week, please send them in again, and we will absolutely do our best to get to them next week or the week after. Graham, I am headed off to Indianapolis Thursday morning, and won't be back until May 27th, believe it or not. So we will be recording next week's episode quite possibly with the sound of IndyCars flying by the media center at 225 miles an hour, as we've done for the last year or two. And, um, I mean, hey, a little bit of ambient racing-ish sounds in the background. Not a bad thing at all. What's up next for you, my friend, before we say goodbye? Uh, well, on uh, Thursday morning, I'll be uh, on a plane at stupid o'clock to the Temple of Speed to Monza for the European Le Mans Series. Thoroughly looking forward to that. 19 LMP2 cars in the top class. But in addition to which, this, one of the support races uh, this weekend is going to be the Masters Endurance Legends. Lola, Aston Martin, I'm looking at you. Well, speaking of looking at you, Thanks, as always, for your time, my friend. We had one or two soapbox moments. Nothing, at maybe even three. Could be four. I'm not sure. We have identified a sponsor. Thanks to Ryan Terpstra. Thank you to Christoph Bouchou and his Emporium of Hammers. And with all that said, we will look forward to speaking next week on the Week in Sports Cars. <laughs>